at some point do want to monetize it, sure. as well as giving back and developing and mm-hmm. so on. But there's ways to monetize it. How, when do they, do they see their exit strategy? Do they see themselves building a business? Do mm-hmm. they want to manufacture a product? Do they want to license it? So they have to understand all of those options before they can really define their goal. Mm. What's given is their idea. Their goal is not there yet. Yeah. So the given and the goal doesn't come concurrently. It's not something that's there until they fully understand what could be all of their options. Hmm. And that's that's extremely important. And then is the function that they're coming up with or the goal or the the item or the thought that they're coming up with, is it unique enough for intellectual property protection? Great question. Right. Mm-hmm. If it is, then they have a little bit more time to really develop a marketing plan that I can help them with. If it doesn't have intellectual property under any circumstance, mm-hmm. and most people don't have the vision as to what kind of intellectual property can come out of their idea. And sometimes they don't even realize that there is an intellectual yeah. property. But if Possibly it's not, not until it's too late. That's right. Mm-hmm. And if it's not, if it doesn't have intellectual property, then their uh, accessibility and their moving and their expedience has to be accelerated because it's limited time before their market could disappear mm-hmm. or it, there could be something else that would replace it. So there's a lot of things and a lot of education and thoughts that have to be put into the process of, I want to follow through with a, a new project, I want to build a business, or what it, what it's all about. No, I think that's, yeah. that's right on. So that's, that's almost the positive side. I know that's a lot right. of them, but let's talk about some pitfalls. What are some things that you see in companies when you're like, oh, they're off by a couple degrees, and you know that down the road this is really going to hurt them? What are things that, you, you, they don't pass the sniff test, let's call it that, that you see and you would like to point out to them like, hey, you need to take a breather. Right. First of all, they need advisors. Mm -hmm. Great point. Yeah, you can't Mm -hmm. do it alone because you have to excel on your strengths and by your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Or there's many different ways that you can seek assistance too, uh, both monetarily or equity-wise or sharing in in your idea or your concept, Mm -hmm. but it's most important to have good advice from trusted Mm -hmm. advisors. And with that, they'll give you good guidance. Most important, these trusted advisors, too, will give you the advice as to how to go about launching your business and what are the steps you have to follow. Mm. What are the the decisions along the way? So many people don't... A a big mistake that's made is, and and this has nothing against the mechanics of the industry. No problem. (laughs) The mechanics of the industry. When I talk about mechanics of industry, I'm talking about doctors, lawyers, mm-hmm. uh, accountants, all of the people have, who can give technical and legal advice and assistance, but not necessarily consult with the necessary information you need to be educated as to when do you go to those technical assistance. Yeah. And a lot of people will start a little bit too quick with the improper people as support and look for business decisions from them. That's mm-hmm. not their function and not their job. You take to them your creative needs. Great. They yeah, take great you through point. the process of what's needed. So good advisors and surrounded with good advisors that if you have a good idea and a good concept, you'll attract those kind of people. Mm-hmm. If you don't, those advisors or a consultant will tell you, save your time, you don't belong here. And I've gone through that. Some people mm-hmm. really went off and got started a little bit too quick, invested a little bit of money, and when I brought out some very important points to them, they said, we never thought of that. Because they didn't go to the proper people in the beginning to give them the possibility or the feasibility, do you really have a business? So that's important. Once they go through that education process, either through a consultant or a trusted advisor, then they know what steps to take to proceed. Hmm. I think that's great. Let me let me talk about that real quick because I think the idea of advisement is really important and it's crucial if you're going to succeed. You, you actually don't have a question. You have to have them. Right. In some form, you're going to get them. Right. So when they're looking for advisors, what are they supposed to be looking for? First of all, somebody with credibility. Mm-hmm. And it would be best if they would look for somebody that has past experience in what they feel is similar to what they want to get started with. Great. Um, there are all sorts of coaches. There's all sorts of consultants. There are all sorts of business advisors and planners. However, not all of them truly understand the practicality 
of what's truly needed. And you need an advisor that can speak in their language hmm. of understanding and not so complicated that they're too embarrassed to ask and say, I don't understand. Yeah. I just don't get it. <laughs> yeah, so that's... it's very important mm -hmm. to have somebody that can really talk basics. Hmm. And that's extremely important. That is. So that's the kind of help and advice you, you seek. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's talk about one of your other, I, I don't know what you'll call it, creations. And that was the when you were in the stock market, and I think the bond area, you had created something for them that made their lives a little bit easier. Can you just tell us really quickly how that come about? I had um, I had acquired, I, was, I started a business, and in that business I was involved in a lot of communication products. And some of those communication products were very specialized, mm -hmm. and it ended up where I got a call from the New York Stock Exchange because I owned some equipment that was proprietary for them. Wow, not a bad call. Not a bad yeah. call because I had acquired this equipment from Western Union when they were divesting themselves and going into the satellite business. Oh, right. And I acquired it for the purpose of refurbishing it and distributing mm -hmm. it for communication purposes to large communication companies. But of that mix of a large volume of equipment happened to be some special equipment that was used on the trading floor hmm. as inquiry stations for the New York Stock Exchange. So they called me, and because I had owned the equipment and purchased it at the right price, it got me into the exchange. I gave them a full payout, payout lease, and I had to provide maintenance for life on it hmm. because they needed a maintenance company yeah. to, to maintain that specialized equipment which was a perfect opportunity for me to be on the trading floor every day to see this institution that was in dire need of support. Yeah. And it was just a matter of, what do I want to tackle first? <laughs> there are some issues that I could help I with mean, in this situation. Tremendous issues. Yeah. So um, after being there for a few years and really helping them in many different ways with mm -hmm. equipment and services, um, there were other things that I came up with as program trading and list processing, but most important, uh, I started with them in 1979, and by 1983, I recognized that the New York Stock Exchange had two types of products that they mm -hmm. sold, or that they traded. One was equity, for capital, stocks, mm -hmm. and the other was corporate listed bonds, which is their fixed income. Oh. So if you had your equity listed on the exchange, you could also have your debt listed. The equity was always traded for years automatically mm. through stockbrokers on the street and so on. The bond market was always an auction market. It mm. was, they had auction traders, just like the COMEX and the commodity market, mm -hmm. where they would bid on the floor and trade, and they were receiving their messages from upstairs firms mm. over the telephone. And it was a very antiquated method. And I recognized that, I was seeing this every day, and I went to the corporate executives, and I said, why don't we automate this? Yeah. And they said, Ron, we've been doing this for 200 years. Yeah. There's no reason to automate it. <laughs> we're good, and we I know said, what we're doing. I have a simple approach that could do tremendous. It, it would increase your volume, it would be attract more people trading corporate listed bonds, it would just be a plus all around. And they said, you're nuts, it won't work. Nobody will buy it, nobody's interested. Did you get the one client? Well, I, I used some, a different methodology. So I said, can I build a system? Mm -hmm. And if I do it, and I build a prototype, will you give me an exclusive license to be the vendor of corporate listed bonds for the New York Stock Exchange? Right. They said, certainly. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and I'll, I'll show you how you handle challenges too, <laughs> along the way. These were the hurdles. So the given was, I saw the need, the market was there because they were already trading, and I was going to make this a, a very expedient network because I was going to automate it and they would no longer have to trade it in an auction crowd. Yeah. And the, the challenge was very simple because there was a main feed line that contained all of the information of the bonds that mm -hmm. was put out over the ticker. And I said, can I take that ticker and feed it to every corporate office and put my little box, which is nothing more than a filter, and I'll filter out only the bonds of interest for that trader. Wow, And he can take a video mm -hmm. terminal and look at it. So it was a very simple system. Mm -hmm. What it was was a filter. Yeah. So I took the main hose, I'll classify it as the main hose from the New York Stock Exchange and put a little filter box on every trader's desk mm -hmm. all throughout Wall Street and they would only see the bonds of interest and yeah, then they could bid an offer, which was mm -hmm. pretty important. And it worked, it worked yeah. beautifully. However, the traders 
if you called them in the morning when the market would open and you couldn't get them before that, uh, if you did, you had 30 seconds to either buy or sell a bond, oh and if you goodness. were trying to sell them something mm -hmm. or solicit, forget it. There wasn't a chance. Yeah. So I figured, how in the world am I going to market this? So I figured I used a little common sense. And very simplistically, I said, I'm going to befriend the best and biggest bond trader <laughs> on Wall Street yeah. and give him this mm. box free. Mm. Meanwhile, everybody is still trading bonds on the auction crowd. Yeah. because I hadn't presented it yet. And I said, I'm going to give this to you free for 30 days. Here's what it does. Try it and use it. He topped everybody's bond. Oh, man. He had yep. it minutes mm -hmm. before everybody else. And his phone rang off the hook. And they were saying, Joe, how are you doing this? We can't buy a bond. You're topping everything. You're driving us crazy. He said, oh, you need one of those bump, 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 they need my company, boxes. Mm -hmm. And call Ron Klein. Here's his number. He can get that box to you. My phone rang off the hook, and within the next 90 days, I had 60% of the entire <laughs> Wall Street market. <laughs> yeah, um, perfect. Which was interesting. Mm -hmm. So now, here I had a system, which was phenomenal, and I figured, now how do I charge? How do I bill for this? Because these firms are not, and it was a very fat time on Wall Street mm -hmm. then. This was back in the 80s. And I said, well, in order to make it valuable to them, and these are traders that make many, many thousands of dollars each day, I've got to start a club. Mm. And I said to every trader, and they've, there were thousands of them, you have to join my club. And it's $10,000 just to join my club. And they said, well, we can make that in a day. Yeah. So they join my club, every trader, $10,000. And I said, now you have to buy this little filter box. Mm -hmm. But they didn't want to buy anything. They wanted to rent it. So I built myself a cash cow. Mm. I rented them a box for $300 Great. a month that cost me $100 to build. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, Unfortunately, brilliant. it was only in use for a quarter of a century. Mm. Oh, well, that's, right. that's a good amount. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but here comes a challenge that was horrendous that I didn't think about, and the New York Stock Exchange didn't think about it. We were up and running, and it was operational, and they came to me. Now, I had to run lease communication lines, telephone lines, to every office on Wall Street, and that's where I fed the data into the brokerage office, and then we would put the little filter boxes on each desk. Well, the New York Stock Exchange came to me after it was up and running and said, Ron, we're canceling your contract with the New York Stock Exchange. It's illegal, you can't have it. I said, what in the world do you mean? Yeah. Well, you're providing this main line to every brokerage office, which they're paying the bill for that line to AT&T, and now that line contains more mm. data that they're entitled to, yeah. and that's against the law because they're not paying for that data. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. And immediately, I simplified the whole project. Mm -hmm. So they said, the, the contract's canceled. You can't have this. We have to do away with the service because you can't provide that to them. And I said, well, you know what? How about if I'm the common carrier? I'll pay for the lines, mm -hmm. and I'll bill the members separately so they don't have access to those lines I own the telephone lines, <laughs> so I'm a pseudo telephone company. And the lawyers of the New York Stock Exchange said hmm. some nasty words and said, "You beat us." Yeah, dang it. <laughs> and that lasted for that lasted for a quarter of a century. Oh, so man. that was a long story just to tell you about a very basic, simple operation of how we automated the bond market that was an auction crowd, and now it trades electronically. No, that's what I love about that story. Is it's such an illustration of how you work. And how it's we very should simple. work, right? It, very it simple approach. Very simple, but it's one. You of You have those... to identify what the yeah. what the mission is, and you have to mm -hmm. identify the model. And of course, all the journey in between was quite complex. Yeah. Manufacturing the equipment, installing the lines, mm -hmm. satisfying that contract. So there were lots of hurdles. Yeah. But I never lost sight as to the data is there. We want to trade electronically. Get rid of the bond trading floor. It was easy. It was easy. Well, you make things look easy. Whenever I'm talking to you, I'm like, man, we can do this. And I, I think that's part of your gift. So I, I would probably want to end it there because I know there'll be a lot more interviews with you and you're Thank somebody you. that has this wealth of information we could go on all night. Thank you. But uh, it's been an absolute privilege and I know Thank the people you. that are watching loved it as well. So really thanks for being with well, you, Well, and my mantra too is, and, and I, I always end all of my interviews and, and speeches with this, you have to be smart, daring, and different. Mm. And that's the answer to success. 
I love it. And I think that's the point that people need to keep with them. And keep it simple. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, Ron. Thank you, Blair. It was a pleasure.